Hello, everyone. My name is Thomas, and welcome to our workforce webinar. As if you are new to the program, and if you're just joining us for the first time, we certainly welcome you, welcome you into the fold. Uh, and if you're a returning visitor, you'll probably notice that we're using a different interface for these webinars. We're using Zoom, which by this point, you're probably well familiar with. Uh, but some one subtle difference between how we did these webinars in the past, uh, the Q&A portion, we're still going to be answering your questions, don't worry, uh, right at the end of the presentation, we'll be answering all of your questions, but it is going to be separate from the chat box. Of course, I see you all are already using the chat box um, and continue to do so, but if you have any questions for our presenters, um, feel free to go to the Q&A box, uh, which is specifically for question and answer portion of the presentation. All right, let's get started. So before I begin, I wanna give a brief introduction on Shimura Economics and Analytics, which is our company. We provide labor market data analysis so our clients can make informed decisions that help their communities thrive. We were founded on 1998 by Dr. Chris Chamura, who is one of our speakers today. And we have offices in the Richmond, Cleveland, and Dallas areas. Who we are are economists, data scientists, and statisticians and business professionals who care about helping your community grow. And we do that primarily through our Jobs EQ software tools, which are the most effective labor market analysis tools on the market. Jobs EQ can provide in-depth labor data all the way down to the block level. And the chat box brief after my introduction, I'm going to be putting a link to our website where you can schedule a demo. Or if you just want to type it in the URL box, it's chamura.com slash demo, where you can check out Jobs EQ for yourself. Chamura is driven by client satisfaction and success. And excellence is our first priority, both in customer service and data quality. We really care about giving you the services you need. And that's why we offer a lot of these services for free, including a podcast series on our website, a blog, and our weekly economic update. I'll be putting the link to the, where you can subscribe to the weekly economic update in the chat momentarily. It's written by our economists, including Chris. And what it is, it's a national overview of the economy that's delivered every weekend straight to your inbox. Now a bit about on our presenters. Starting up, we'll have Dr. Chris Chamura, who is the founder, CEO, and chief economist of Chamura Economics and Analytics, followed by Dr. Brian Shelley, who is the manager of our consulting services and has over 20 years of experience in educational research. And finally, we'll have Greg Chamura, our chief quality officer, who leads the data governance department. All right, take it away, Chris. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining us here today. So we're talking about workforce here, a picnic of labor fixings, fixings um, since we're now into the summer. And first, I'll give you a national economic update. We're seeing some encouraging economic trends. We're seeing progress toward herd immunity, although it, that progress has slowed since earlier this year. After I provide that information, then Brian will talk to you about what jobs and skills are in demand. And then finally, Greg will um, talk about the trends that we're seeing in skills. So first, the national overview. And I put up this picture of the windmills here because the Biden administration is making a lot of investments to support and diversify the domestic energy um, sources here in the US. And there was a really good article in this morning's Wall Street Journal about reshoring manufacturing. And um, the Biden administration has identified four critical industries. If you're in economic development, then I'm sure these are industries that you're all targeting because of the policies around them. But um, pharmaceuticals, semiconductor, advanced batteries, and minerals are all being targeted um, to um, come back to the US. But the Wall Street Journal article that I'm mentioning here was all about the solar panel industry. And so right now, um, 
solar panel industry is lobbying to try to get on that list of critical industries. So in any case, in terms of the national economy, if you've been in our webinars earlier, you know then that uh, across the globe, uh, recession is defined as two consecutive declines in quarterly GDP. Uh, but here in the US, we've got this National Bureau of Economic Research. And within that um, organization, they have the Business Cycle Dating Committee that identifies when recessions begin and end. And so in gray, you can see the recession here that started and especially when we go to the next slide and you see GDP, you're probably wondering why haven't they declared that the recession has ended yet? And it usually takes them some time before doing so um, because they wanna make sure uh, the numbers don't get revised. Uh, but again, they look at a lot of indicators. Here are three of them, employment, uh, notice the increase in employment. When we went into the COVID recession, we lost all the jobs. We're climbing out of that hole and we're seeing about 500,000 jobs created over the last uh, couple of uh, months. We will see Jul um, June data coming out uh, next week. Um, I believe it's the 2nd of July. On the right-hand side is uh, personal income and consumption. So consumer spending is extremely important because it makes up about 70% of GDP. So notice the quick drop off as we went into the recession, we were told to stay at home. Uh, we didn't go out and spend. Um, and then you see uh, the numbers increasing. This is a year over year change number. So down just 3% or so. Uh, here now when people were starting to get their vaccines, um, you see the jump in spending year over year in April as more people were vaccinated. And uh, income, on the other hand, you see the big jump as we went into the recession. And that's because of the CARES Act, um, the relief money that was in the CARES Act. I call it relief because it was just to help us get through this shutdown period and the uh, Payroll Protection Act money. And then toward the end of last year, we saw another spike in income as individuals receive more stimulus in terms of um, money going to households and also the additional money going to those people who were unemployed. And then again, another spike as we've seen some more stimulus um, in the economy. So a lot of that stimulus has been saved by individuals. And when we go into the second half of the year, we would expect to see consumption to continue to remain very strong. At the bottom, another indicator that this group looks at industrial production, and this is an index. So notice that when we went into the recession, it plummeted uh, down to almost 90, and it has been coming back. Uh, this little downward blip is because of the snowstorms that we saw earlier this year hit the South, and in particular, uh, the Texas economy. So GDP then, um, broadest indicator of economic activity. Here you see the COVID starting in the first quarter of last year, a drop off of about 5%, then nearly 30% decline. And then we saw a rebound of about the same amount. So when we look at this from a uh, is the recession over point of view, um, my guess is that this is going to be a very short recession, probably just two quarters in length. Um, here you see now the latest GDP number that came out the first quarter of this year, 6.4%. It, it gets revised three times um, uh, before it's considered final and it will be revised um, this week. In fact, it's expected to remain at 6.4%. As we go over the next year, we're looking around 5% or more. Uh, then it slows down to around 4%. Anything above 2% is considered very strong for this economy. So with all the stimulus, and the relief money, um, people starting to get back to work, people starting to feel um, uh, safer to go out and spend. We expect the second half of this year to be extremely strong and for that strength to fall over into 2022. But then after that, 2023, we'd expect some of the stimulus to um, wear off by then. 2023, 24, uh, this economy would expect to get closer to that 2% uh, growth rate that we see over time. So herd immunity is very important in terms of this economy getting back to normal. Um, and so 
here on this slide, um, before we get into the model that we have on when, when will we get to herd immunity, that's driving um, economic growth. You see in orange, the seven day moving average of the cases of um, confirmed daily COVID-19 infections in the US. And you can see the spike that we had related to the um, Thanksgiving holiday and then around Christmas time. And then it came down um, significantly, spring break, saw a little bit of an uptick, but great news right now, it's the lowest it has been since the March 2020 pandemic outbreak. So that's great news um, from that perspective. In terms of, again, this is driving our forecast and typically, you know, forecasts are driven by interest rates or, or um, gasoline prices or um, consumer spending. But in, in this case, our, our forecasts are being driven by uh, COVID-19 infections. And so, of course, we're not medical scientists, so we're relying on the University of Washington to drive our model in terms of, of how many more infections that we're going to see. So again, you see it coming down. And by the way, if you're interested in this um, model, you can go to the site and look at it for your particular state. But you see it coming down through August and then a little bit of an upward um, um, increase here, probably due to the seasonality of um, this virus um, that is similar to other um, flu or um, getting a cold, you see an increase happening in the fall. So, but again, not spiking up like what we saw during October, November, December. So in terms of our model, here are some of our assumptions and you can go to our blog to read about more of them. We've got the 600 million vaccines purchased from Moderna and Pfizer, 200 from Johnson & Johnson. As of yesterday, over 177 Americans, that is 53.4%, that's of total population, not just adults, but of all population, have received a single dose and 150 million or 45% are fully vaccinated. On average, over the past week, we're seeing administered about 1.1 million doses per day. To give you an idea of, of how that has changed at the beginning of this year, that was 1 million. Um, many um, scientists didn't believe that we would be able to get up to 4 million. We did get up to 4 million doses per day about a month and a half ago, and that has since dropped off to this number. So part of our model includes uh, state level vaccine hesitancy rates, and those are forecast by the Census Bureau Household Plus Survey. So as we see um, more people becoming vaccinated, we see um, still quite a number that are hesitant to get vaccinated. We assume that 80% is the threshold for herd immunity. Um, and we also assume that the vaccine maintains high levels of efficacy against the new and existing uh, variants. So what does this mean for the economy? We have three scenarios. So here is the percentage of people that have been vaccinated. Um, again, trying to get to 80%, which would be herd immunity. And in our optimistic case, we see that happening in October. In our more likely case, we see that happening at the end of this year. And the pessimistic case, which might be people remain resistant to taking the vaccine or the variant, uh, this does not work well against the variant and it might be um, middle of next year. I believe the Biden administration's goal was to get us 70% of the population vaccinated by July 4th. Given the current um, slowing in rates and where we are, it does not appear that um, we will be reaching that goal. But uh, what does this mean uh, in terms of states? Because states are varying. So in green, uh, we're seeing those states that are moving faster toward herd immunity. And so you can see the Northeast is doing pretty well from that perspective. The blue and the darkest blue are those that are moving um, the slowest toward herd immunity. And then finally, uh, based on our most likely scenario, here you see in uh, green, those states that will get there the quickest. And New Mexico um, shows up from that perspective. Um, and then those that will get there um, at the slowest pace, uh, we see Utah, um, Tennessee, and Georgia um, on that um, slower track. 
So with that, um, let me turn the slides over to uh, Brian. Thanks, Chris. Um, and so what we're gonna do during the rest of this presentation, first of all, thank you everybody for being here. Um, what we're gonna do during the rest of this presentation is talk about the scope of the recovery and specifically some of the uh, conversation that you hear around worker shortages right now. This is big in the news. Um, some people wanna say that the, um, st the uh, stimulus payments are keeping people from working. Um, but the one thing that's not controversial is that there are jobs out there that are not being filled that is slowing the growth of the economy. Um, and that there are skills um, that are not being filled. And, and the skills gap thing has been going on for a while. Um, you've heard people throughout the 2010s talk about an emerging skill gap um, that led to, I think I saw one study that said, um, you know, by 2023, there may be 2.3 million jobs that are not filled um, with the skilled labor that is needed to do that job. Um, and so you may be asking, what can we do to remedy this, right? On one hand, we have uh, people who are still out of work. Um, and on the other, we have the um, uh, lack of skills and lack of people filling those jobs. And what we're going to do today, what Greg and I are going to do in the rest of our time is really break into those questions. Um, I'm going to talk about, for those of you who are Jobs EQ users, um, what you can do to start filling the skills gap today, as soon as you get off this webinar, how you can use Jobs EQ to identify um, which jobs are most in demand right now and which jobs are, uh, what skills people need to be able to fill them, which will help for things like training and stuff like that. Then Greg's going to do a deep dive on sort of some other things that our skills data can tell us um, that will also help inform sort of training decisions and how you think about the workforce more generally. So let's start with a look into Jobs EQ. And, and those of you who are Jobs EQ users are going to recognize a lot of screenshots in this presentation. Um, those of you who are not Jobs EQ users, don't worry, I'm going to walk you right through this. Um, and if you're interested in Jobs EQ after seeing this, um, certainly Thomas will put up a link so that um, you can learn uh, all about Jobs EQ and the data you're seeing here today. Um, so I have a screenshot up here from our RTI analytic. Uh, RTI pulls in uh, job postings each night from about 40,000 different sources. Um, and so it's pulling in job postings, it's deduplicating those job postings, and it is um, aggregating those trends. So we can do things like, as we see right here, what are the top occupations that are hiring in the Richmond area? I picked Richmond because that's where I'm sitting right now. And by the way, if you're also in Richmond, you can see that the, uh, the uh, biblical rain is about to fall on us. So uh, I hope you're all inside. Um, so anyway, all the occupations in Richmond, which ones are hiring the most? And I can put all kinds of filters on this. Since we're talking about skilled labor here, um, I thought that we would start with a, with a minimum requirement of what jobs are available in job postings today in the Richmond area that require a high school diploma or, or equivalent, right? Um, and you can see here, um, there are 9,892 um, job postings that are active right now that are hiring, uh, that require a high school diploma in 402 different occupations. And you can see, right, what some of them are. Retail salespeople, first line supervisors of retail sales workers, stockers, security guards, all these different things. Now, you can get more granular with RTI data too. Um, and so one of the things that I've done on this slide, right, is I have said same parameters, high school diploma equivalent, Richmond, Virginia, right? But now I said, let's look at all manufacturing occupations. Because um, we've heard, right, if you study the literature on skills what's, uh, at all, you're going to find out that the biggest gap in skilled labor might actually be in manufacturing right now. Because manufacturing is not the same as it was in the 1950s 
um, when everybody was just sort of doing their one little thing on the assembly line and stuff right now. Advanced manufacturing these days requires uh, a bunch of skills that we'll get into a second, like um, knowledge of robotics, uh, knowledge of AI, all these different things, right? And so what we can look at is we can look at what are the manufacturing jobs in the um, um, in Richmond that are hiring right now. And you can see it looks similar, um, but not all the way. Um, so you have industrial machines, mechanics right here. Um, you have uh, inspectors, testers, sorters, samplers, and weighers. Um, so again, all the jobs that you, if, if you're working in workforce in particular, right, um, and you have somebody who just got out of a manufacturing occupation, you may want to help that person search for a job. Well, you go into the jobs EQ, you go into the RTI analytic, and you pull up what are the jobs uh, that are available in manufacturing, Okay. Um, and what's neat about these is for these jobs, you can see the skills and certification most in demand. Again, this is from RTI. This is our job posting uh, data. And what we're seeing here is for all the occupations, manufacturing occupations that require high school diploma in Richmond, Virginia, these are the top certifications that are required, right? Um, so you can see that on job postings, 11 separate job postings uh, require somebody be a certified welder. 10 um, separate um, forklift, uh, 10 separate job postings say that you need to be for forklift certified. So if I'm at technical school and I'm listening to this and I'm in the Richmond area, I say, wait a minute, we have a welding program. Maybe this is something that we can expand and market to people to say like, look, there are welding jobs available that are not being filled right now in Richmond. Come um, take a certificate program of uh, however many months it takes to get certified as a welder and you're going to be able to have a good job um, that pays uh, something like a living wage um, as soon as you complete that. Um, for both, um, um, Looking at RTI here, now we get into skills, right? And the hard skills that are required to entering these manufacturing. And you can see plumbing in great demand. All right, can we, if we are a high school, um, can we incorporate plumbing into any of our um, CTE programs that we're using right now? Um, is there a way to expand a CTE pro, uh, a plumbing program at the, um, at the technical school and at the community college level, right? Um, workforce organizations, can you do things like um, set up trainings for Microsoft Office? Because one of the skills that we always see, no matter what the, ex what, what the um, occupation is, is we always see that Microsoft Office um, is one of the top skills that are in demand. So again, what RTI lets you do is RTI lets you know what are the certifications and what are the skills that are most in demand on current job postings so that those of you who are in training organizations out there know where to um, uh, target your training, can come up with new ideas for curriculum uh, that will help people get back to work quickly and help us recover um, from the economic hard times. Um, you're also able to see skills and certifications among our resume data. Um, we've got uh, last count, I think 22 million resumes in our resume database. Um, and you can see here for manufacturing in Richmond, um, we have about 1,183. Now, manufacturing is not the best uh, economic sector to show you resume data, simply because a lot of people who get hired in manufacturing don't need resumes to do it, right? But you can see these are the skills that are in um, demand, or these are the skills that are in the labor supply. 358 people advertise in their resume that they have maintenance of some sort, right? 256 say uh, that they can drive a forklift. Um, and so you might be asking yourself, all right, this is useful to see the supply and, uh, uh, of different skills in the labor force. 
And we just saw the demand uh, on job postings for separate skills, right? So we have supply and demand. Boy, I wish Jobs EQ had an analytic that uh, compared them. Wish no further, right? Um, you can identify skill gaps uh, in Jobs EQ by a, by a analytic uh, creatively called skill gaps. Um, and you can compare, what skill gaps does is it compares our resume and job posting data. All right. And so what you see here is what are the skill gaps in manufacturing? That is, where do, um, um, where do uh, more job postings list that a skill is needed than people who on their resume say that they have it? So you can see here, remember I told you about Microsoft Office? Well, look at this. There are, there are 55, uh, there's an opening of about 55 job postings right now that, um, that um, are advertising for Microsoft Excel. And that is not present in the labor force as defined by resumes. Uh, pneumatic systems, 44 of them are present on job postings that aren't present on resumes. And so you're really seeing here um, how you can target your training. Um, and how um, if you are a, for example, an employer, um, you can see it's not a matter of hiring the people that are out there in an analytic like this. You can see that actually there's a shortage of workers. We may need to look into training options. We may need to think about how to reskill or upskill our current workforce. Um, and so really um, what JobDQ can help you do um, is understand where there are occupation and skills gaps um, and understand what training you can target um, to help fill those gaps. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, what we do with our skills data that isn't in JobCQ. Okay, thank you, Mark. Let me move it over to my screen. Greg, I think it's Brian. Um, Brian, <laughs> sorry, Brian. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, you can see my screen now? Yes. Okay, Okay. so as Brian was talking about, they're giving us examples of specific uh, skills that we could examine uh, for occupations. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have a slightly different take um, looking at the trends in skills. So, you know, what, is going to be growing, what is forecast to grow, what has been growing, you know, what's hot, what's not. So keeping with the picnic theme here, this is uh, around the campfire, maybe uh, having some dessert at this time, you know, maybe some s'mores. And in this case, we'll look at a few examples of how we could try to um, figure out what the trends are with skills. So there's data out there on occupations. So some traditional data from the BLS uh, for example, on you know historical occupations and forecasts for that, but there's not the same uh, level of data for the skills and what has been growing, what's expected to grow. Um, so in this case, uh, we're going to take a look at three different ways of trying to uh, disseminate what those trends are. All right. So um, first off, to talk about the data source here, this is the same data that, that Brian was just talking about here. So those online job ads that we have in JobsEQ. And you can see here the first uh, chart here, it, you see that it's, it's very volatile um, or it could be volatile over time. Um, especially last year, we saw a lot of volatility uh, with, the, with the pandemic and the shutdown. And uh, one way I'm going to define, you know, what's a hot skill or not is looking at the historical data. And I use three uh, criteria here to uh, focus on that definition. The first one is I looked at skills that grew at least 15% for each of the last three years. And so with those jobs uh, ads data, there could be uh, volatility if you look at too short of timeframes. Um, so things could bounce around a bit. And so by looking at having at least 15% growth each of the last three years, we're talking about some skills that were really growing consistently, strongly and consistently over the last three years, all right? They're not just a flash in a pan. Uh, the second criteria there is that they all are associated with higher than average wage jobs. So uh, these skills are gonna be really hot because if you have these skills, 
you're going to be eligible for jobs uh, that you know provide really good wages. So, for example, um, you know, cash handling uh, or ability to operate a, a cash register, you know, things like that. Okay, they may be in high demand, um, especially now if people aren't willing to take uh, some of those uh, lower wage jobs. Um, but you know, they're not necessarily hot in terms of they're going to get you a, a you know really high paying job. So I'm only looking at those skills here that are associated with high wage jobs. Lastly, only skills that were had at least 20,000 unique job ads in the last year, so in 2020. Um, so these aren't like really small, rare kind of skills, but they're, they're pretty um, large in-demand skills. So using those three criteria, I came up with a list of 19 skills. And not by design, but really by accident, once I came up with this list of 19 skills, why well, I gave them a name, I called them all blue chip skills because they're so popular and they have such strong growth and you know having good returns. But it was really interesting that all 19 of these were associated with computer occupations. Um, and so you can see the list here. Um, so we have things like uh, you know, Google Go, um, machine learning, Terraform, Apache, Kafka, all sorts of computer skills. And on the right hand side, these are the, the common job titles associated with those. So all of these skills were found uh, in multiple jobs, multiple occupations. Uh, but the ones on the right, these were the ones that were either the most common or one of the very high common jobs uh, associated with these skills. So you see a lot of DevOps engineers, um, some uh, software engineering, cybersecurity. Those are the types of jobs uh, that happen to be associated with these different skills. So in these cases, again, this is looking at the historical trend over the last three years. Here's all these skills were just really growing strongly over that time period. And there's basically a lot of ads out there for them. All right, so that's one way that we could, you know, use these data to kind of see what's the trend for these skills. So looking at those historical data. Um, another way we could look at this is looking at what I'm calling the turnover rates. And a few months ago, I was in a conversation uh, with some educators in Texas. And uh, we were talking about an issue they are facing. So they um, were looking at program review. So this is at the post-secondary level. And they were saying, well, most of their programs, they'll review them every about four years. And they were thinking that for some of their programs, especially the computer programs, um, the, the curriculum, they need to review them more often, um, like maybe every two years. And that's what their uh, you know, instincts were telling them. But they were wondering, uh, is there some data out there that could justify that? So after that, that kind of led to this analysis. So here I chose uh, five different occupations. You can see them down the side, accountants, nurses, software developers, medical managers, and social uh, and human services assistants. Um, so these five occupations there, one thing they have in common, they're all uh, required college education for those jobs typically. And um, also, they're also very common among the job ads. So they were among the most common in job ads that required college education. And the analysis that we performed on these was we looked at how the skills were changing within those occupations. So the employer requirements for these occupations, were they changing quickly or not over time? So the skills needed by these occupations. If the skills are changing really quickly, then that would imply that educators need to review their curriculum more often for the occupations that are changing more quickly, the, the requirements, right? So for example, accountants at the top, the way we did this is we would look at, okay, for accountants, one of the job requirements, one of the common ones is uh, QuickBooks. And let's say if 20% um, of uh, the employers in 2019 required QuickBooks, and let's say it increased, next year to maybe 25%. So that would be a five percentage point change in the demand for QuickBooks or the requirement for QuickBooks among accountants. So we'd count that as well. That's a five percentage point turnover change. And then we look at the same thing for Excel. Well, maybe Excel went from 15% uh, to 15 and a half percent. That would be a half a percent change, okay? So we looked at all these thousands of skills and we summed up all of the changes 
and we call that the turnover rate. And that's what you see here in the middle column. So from one year to the next, the, for accountants, there was a 22 percentage point change in the, all the different requirements for that job. And then you can see the results for the other ones, nurses, um, software developers, and so forth. The thing that really sticks out, software developers, 70%, a 70 percentage point change, much higher than all the other ones, right? Now, another way to think about this is with the last column, how many years do we need to, uh, how many years need to transpire before we get to 100 percentage point changes within the skills? So basically, it's just the inverse of that middle column. And the result there, another way to think about really the same data, and software developers, it only takes 1.4 years before you have that 100% turnover uh, in those skills needed, um, which is over twice as fast as it happens for accountants, which happens every like four and a half years. And the change within accountants is twice as fast than the social and human services assistance. So for that occupation, it's every nine years, you're gonna reach that 100 percentage point turnover, right? So basically that last column is giving us an indicator um, of how quickly we, you know, basically a justification, how quickly do we need to review um, the curriculum for these occupations? So software developers definitely uh, per this metric uh, should be reviewed more often than any of these other ones, okay? Now there are other factors in how often the curriculum needs to be Reviewed, this shouldn't be the only one and only metric, but it is something to provide evidence, you know, to how, how often we need to be doing that. Right. Okay, so that's another way we could look at these changes within skills. And we have a third way. And in this uh, analysis, we're looking at the forecast changes. So um, the BLS, they provide occupation forecast at the national level. And, and we carry those over into jobs EQ and we forecast those at the, the local level as well and within industry, industries. Um, in this case, we looked at um, how those occupation uh, growth rates will affect the skills needed. So uh, the assumption we ran here was for all the different skills we have, and here we looked at all the, the what we call the hard skills, so the soft skills, we also track those, but I didn't include that in, in this analysis, just the, just the hard skills. Um, assuming that those hard skills kind of stay the same in terms of how often they're used within an occupation, because of the occupation growth rates over the next uh, 10 years, you know, what's gonna be that annual change in demand for those uh, hard skills? And so on the left-hand side, we see a, a list of the 10 skills that have fast growth rates. On the right-hand side, these are 10 that have the lowest growth rates. And I should let you know here that I limited these again to only those with 20,000 or more ads. Um, we have a lot of skills in our library and you know some are just very rare that will show up um, and they're kind of more obscure. And so just to keep them to ones that are more familiar, I limited this to just show the, the more popular ones. But again, on the left-hand side, so these are mainly associated with um, IT type positions. There's also some healthcare in here as well. So at the very top one, caregiving, for example. So um, not, not a really big surprise, the occupations expected to grow quick, most quickly over the next uh, 10 years are a lot of computer related jobs and healthcare. And so seeing these uh, skills related to those positions, um, they're expected to have that same uh, similar growth rates. Um, again, they may even grow faster or maybe even slower if they're changing within the occupations, but this is, can be one baseline for how these might change over time. On the right-hand side, now we see some, uh, some skills that uh, will be declining at least if we look at it at the occupation level. So these are mainly, you can see related, there's a lot of office jobs that these are related to, um, you know, copy machines, faxing, uh, switchboards, so switchboards related to um, telephone operators. Um, and those jobs, uh, you know, by the BLS are expected to decline um, at least somewhat over the next 10 years. So likewise, these skills have that associated 
uh, potential decline. Now, some of these may actually grow if they expand within the occupation. So QuickBooks, for example, QuickBooks is used by accountants, which are expected to grow, but QuickBooks is also used um, by bookkeepers and secretaries, and those are occupations expected to decline. All right, so that's why this, that's why QuickBooks showed up on this list with an overall decline. Um, but if QuickBooks is used more frequently within those occupations, it may still see growth in demand, all right? But still, because of those occupations going away in general, it'll have this uh, kind of a net negative forecast, at least at the occupation level, um, if that makes sense. Um, so again, we see a lot of office uh, skill jobs, uh, skills here. Um, there are some production skills as well. So the mic micrometers, that's related to uh, production and retail management related to the retail. So those also showed up in this list. Okay, now, so I showed you three different ways we could have metrics to try to measure uh, skills, the trends and skills. And we have a poll question for you now because in Jobs EQ, we, we like to show lots of data and there's different ways we could show things. And some of these things I just showed you, we don't have them at the ready. So you could do the analysis, you could grab the numbers and you could do these computations on your own, but they're not kind of already made for you. So I'm, I'm very curious um, which of these, if any of these would be helpful for, for you all in your work. So that's the reason why we're asking. We always like to stay very in, in close contact with our clients who we're offering them uh, data that's useful for them. So now Thomas has a poll question uh, to ask you if one of these three methods or any of them would be uh, useful to you in your work. Yep, so I just launched the poll. Uh, it should have popped up on your screen. If not, uh, just go to the menu at the bottom and click on polls and it should be up. Yep, I see you guys are voting. Give you a second. While you all are voting, um, thanks, Greg and Brian. Really interesting um, information. Um, we will provide the slide deck uh, either tomorrow or later today, as well as the recording here if you want to pass it on to some of your other colleagues. And we will be answering questions shortly. Thomas, did you have another question or should we answer the q and A? I was just gonna wait uh, a couple more seconds for the poll to wrap up. And uh, we have a, a couple questions from Roy in the chat um, on Greg's presentation. So I was gonna get to that real quick. He first asked, Hi, Greg, when you say grew at least 15% in each year, by 15%, do you mean the percent of increase in the frequency? How often, how many ads in which the skill is mentioned or listed by the employer using RTI, that is? Right, right, thanks, good question. And actually, so it was basically looking at the overall volume. Um, though what we did was, um, when I computed that, I made an adjustment for, the overall volume in the US in all ads. So for example, in 2020, you know, we saw fewer ads, especially in the springtime due to the pandemic. And so what I did was I normalized each year so that each year had the same overall volume. And then I looked within that how um, the, the change in skills happened. So um, pretty much, like you said, by the overall demand number, how, how often it occurred overall, but you know, with that, that first step of normalizing the overall volume of all the ads. Thanks for that answer. Uh, one more comment from Rory. He said the Skittles turnover rate chart is really interesting. Could you provide more information on this and how you arrived at these numbers and approach this? 
And would that be available anywhere on your website or any blog post that I could read further? Uh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. We um, this was something um, pretty new that we've done, uh, been working on. So yeah, uh, following up with a blog post is a good idea. But what we did was within these individual occupations is we looked at uh, how often skills were being requested by the employers. Um, you know, so for example, with the software developers, um, let's say. Um, you know, this Raspberry Pi uh, skill, if it shows up, you know, in 5% of the ads in one year and 6% of the ads in the next year, that's a one percentage point change. And so that was a 1% of, a, of turnover in, in their mix of skills. And then we would compute what was the change in each skill for software developers, add up all of those changes, and that becomes that turnover percentage. So for software developers, a 70% total percent change um, occurred on average from one year to the next. And I, I did that computation over the last three years. And I was doing this, I, I only looked at the hard skills and the certifications. Um, soft skills I left out of the analysis because um, it, the results didn't look um, as, a, as appropriate with those in there. Um, and, th and, that, and that's how we obtain the turnover and then the inverse of the turnover literally one over that turnover rate is how we have the number of years to get to 100%. Um, Thomas, it seems like there are two questions on the economy side. I'll answer those very quickly. Um, one person asked about the unemployment benefits. Are they included in household income? Good question. Household income is very broad. It includes things in addition to wages and salaries all transfer payments. So yes, unemployment benefits are included. So is social security. So is rent. If you're a landowner or a homeowner, the rent income that you get and investment income. So it's a very broad indicator. Uh, and then another person asked, will our forecast change based on reported increases in COVID-19 hospitalizations that were reported? Um, yes, that will likely cause the getting to the 70% or 80% uh, inch out a bit, but we don't expect to see a spike um, in terms of um, uh, COVID-19 um, hospitalizations. We would expect to see just a, a soft movement um, in terms of when we get to that uh, herd immunity in our forecast. And I think, Brian, did you have an example you wanted to show Cindy? Yes, I do. Um, so Cindy asked, um, you have a lot of examples from uh, major metropolitan areas. Um, what about smaller populations? What about a rural community of say 20,000? Um, and uh, would you look at uh, a region within 50, 40, 50 miles radius as well? And I think, yeah, so you can see here, Cindy, that we can absolutely do that, right? So uh, what I've done is I have gone up to in Jobs EQ, I have gone up to this little person in the right hand corner of my browser and I've clicked region and done a region customization. And what you can see right here is that, and, and this is a perfect example of, of you being able to incorporate your local knowledge into your use of Jobs EQ. Um, so you know that people have to come a long way and you pick 50 miles from liberal Kansas where you're, rotate, where you're located. And you can see, we can absolutely make a region like that. Um, we can also make a region uh, around uh, based on drive time. So if you wanna go by like 30, 60 minute radius around liberal Kansas, you can draw a region, you can enter specific areas on the region, but I'm just gonna go ahead and save this right now. And now you get to use this region like any other in Jobs EQ. Um, and so I'm going to go back then um, to uh, RTI and I'm going to put in liberal Kansas. And look, there's my region that we just made with the 50 mile radius. So these are now, this is now every job posting that is uh, been active in the last 30 days in, um, um, uh, in liberal Kansas and a 50 mile region. 
Um, and you ask a question about uh, rural um, communities and how we handle them. And uh, I'm actually gonna defer that to Greg, who I think can answer it more accurately than I can. Greg, are you there? Oh, sorry, I missed uh, my mute button. I clicked somewhere else. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was looking at some of the other, other questions. So the rural question was around uh, which data? RTI. What? Yeah, oh, it was okay, sure. So, um, yeah, we like, like uh, Brian said, we have over 40,000 uh websites that we crawl, so it, it's uh, the coverage is pretty good and it includes individual companies. And you're right, for the smaller companies, we're less likely to have those. So, in if you have some uh, in a rural area, if there's some small companies, I mean, um, you know. You can't guarantee 100% coverage of every single company, especially the very, very small companies, right? But we also include aggregators in um, our sources. And so a lot of companies uh, do use those aggregators, especially those who you know, even don't have their own website to advertise their jobs. Um, there's a lot of aggregators out there. I mean, there's some really big ones like Indeed and so forth. Um, but there's a lot of aggregators out there that don't cost that much or are free that employers will put on. And we, we crawl those, we bring them all in. We're very careful to deduplicate the ads um, because a lot of jo jobs are found on multiple websites, um, but we do, de do, de we do deduplicate them. So we have just unique job postings in the analytic. Um, so uh, Tony had a question about um, whether a bus route region can be created. Um, not yet, Tony, um, but what a great idea to incorporate public tra uh, transit into um, Jobs EQ. And so that will we're adding right that to our um, suggestion box and uh, going to put that through the process and, and see if we can get that rolling. Um, uh, someone asked, are there new job listings or unique skills that emerged during the pandemic related to manufacturing, logistics, healthcare, and public health that will remain as a result of COVID impacts? Well, I think Greg's presentation goes to that a little bit. I can speak on sort of the logistics and healthcare. So predictably, right, um, anything associated with um, uh, delivery, um, whether it be Amazon or food delivery or, or anything like that, online shopping, basically. That grew tremendously. Uh, I, I think they said, Amazon said that its growth was three times in 2020, what it had been previously. And so anything associated with online ordering and stuff like that grew in logistics. Um, in healthcare and public health, one of the interesting things that we're monitoring is the, remote, is the uh, rise in remote health um, uh, in, in sort of virtual health consultations, things like that. Um, and it will be interesting to see how that continues to, um, how much that continues to grow um, or sustain its growth during uh, now that we're sort of getting back to normal. And I will tell you that something like, last time I checked, it was like 60, 65%. 65% of the job growth in the healthcare public health sector um, in sort of telehealth, as they call it, right? So in the, jo in the jobs that pertain to what you can do online, what you can do remotely, that type of stuff, 60% of those were um, at least in uh, mental health services. So are we going to see uh, people continue to use uh, mental health services now that the pandemic is ending? Um, we'll see. Brian, there's a good question for you since you're on the RTI page. Um, Lori is asking whether you could look at, say, top employers like the largest hospitals and see what sort of skills that they have. All right. So let's go to let's do a keyword filter. Um, let's see. Actually, let's do an occupation filter. Um, so, yes. Um, so the answer to that, right, and, and I'll show you this really quickly, Lori, because uh, I know we're running out of time. 
absolutely one of the main things that we show in our aggregation of job posting data in RTI is the employers in a region. Now you can see sort of the top employers that are hiring right here in our liberal Kansas 50 mile region. And you can see Centura Health is one of them, right? Um, but let's say I just want to see who is hiring registered nurses, all right? And then look at this. Um, you get down to uh, Centura Health, Mays Home Health, uh, the Santana District Hospital. Um, so yes, and, and there are a variety of ways that you can search by um, what hospitals are hiring, what, who's hiring in healthcare. Um, but certainly we can absolutely search that and, and figure out who's hiring by the employer. I see also a couple other questions that I could answer. So there was one from Jim Skinner about what time frame the postings were reviewed for the annual skills turnover. So for that one, we looked at from 2018 through 2020. And again, I, and I didn't mention it when I was talking about this. So we used a couple of years there. Um, so we weren't just limiting ourselves to one year. The other thing that we were doing was we use postings across the whole nation. So that was a national level metric that I was referring to in, in that slide. This also can be done though at a smaller level. So if you wanna just look at a state, how were, how were things changing within our specific state? You could certainly do the analysis at that level as well. Um, I also see another question. Uh, someone asked about how our tool combats for entry level or lower skill workers who often do not have resumes at all. Okay, so um, when we do the analysis, one thing we do is we do it at the occupation level. So we look at what their most, for when we're working with the, the resumes, their profiles, we look at what their most recent job was. So if they were a software developer or if they were a retail worker, we use that, um, that fact when we look at, when we do the analysis for all retail workers or all software developers, all right? Um, now, if someone doesn't have a resume, well, they're going to be missing. And certainly nothing we can do about that in terms of uh, you know, that not being there. But one thing we also do in the analysis is we're working with job postings on the demand side and uh, resumes on the supply side, is when we compare them, we do a bit of uh, normalization. Because the other thing, when you try to do a, a, a skill gap like that, that's, that's kind of tricky is if you think about it, um, certain skills are maybe more or less likely to appear in a job ad than they are in a resume. So um, when we were first looking at these data, we noticed, yeah, in a lot of cases, there were certain things, like especially like those Microsoft Office kind of skills that, you know, they might show up, you know, way more often in resumes because just people are just, you know, putting them there uh, than they would in a job ad or maybe even the reverse. So we do a little bit of a normalization there at the national level to account for, for that fact. And also what you're mentioning is that we're missing some of the pieces of, of the market. So we look at, okay, at the national level, if the um, demand and supply are basically at equilibrium, what's the regional variation? So then when we look at the skills gaps, um, we look at that gap basically relative to the nation. So if you have a gap there, um, you are in short supply relative to where the, the whole nation is. Greg, can um, you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, um, uh, Ryan. Uh, real quick, uh, Nancy Aird asked, um, uh, can you look at job programs by uh, specific SOC codes? And as you can see uh, right now on my screen, Nancy, um, yes, absolutely. We can type in sort of any SOC code we want. Uh, we can put in Boilermakers, um, and there they are. And Greg, Daniel has a question about shapefiles. Could you answer that? It's under the chat. Okay. Um, to be uploaded, yes. So uh, with the shapefiles, you can, so if you're, when you're creating regions in Jobs EQ, so um, like when you're creating a drive time, for example, um, similar to that, you could uh, upload a shapefile, so then you could do the analysis at that level of detail. So you could save that shapefile as a region in Jobs EQ and run the analysis on that region. 
I think we've run up against our timeline here. Are there any other questions that are out there? As we're, we're taking a look, Brian and Greg, um, thank you all again for attending and please let us know topics for the future. We're happy to continue these webinars as long as you find them useful. Um, we hope you're all enjoying getting out a little more. It does feel like we're getting back to normal and certainly the um, economy is starting to show that um, we are as well. So um, if there are no other questions, then thank you again. Um, please be safe and um, we look forward to talking to you on our next webinar. Yep, and just as a reminder, uh, like Chris said earlier, we'll be sending out a link to the slides and recording. Uh, should be later today at the latest by tomorrow. Thanks for coming and have a good one.